Hey, it's Matt Sager. Hope your Friday is going excellently. It was pointed out to me earlier this week by a friend. It was mentioned to me that, you know, you talk an awful lot about the business of comics, about comic spinoffs and the media and things of that nature, but I don't think I've ever heard you do a comic review. Not new comics at any rate. I've certainly done a couple of new-to-you comic book day reviews of classics, and I've done a little bit of commentary on comics, new releases, but admittedly very little. And there's a few reasons for that. Having a fairly busy life doing this podcast and lots of other stuff, it's hard for me to block away the time required to say, all right, I'm going to review X amount of comics this week. I'm going to consistently review these five or six titles. Frankly, quality is spotty enough that it would be very difficult for me. There's maybe three titles I could commit to consistently reading and therefore reviewing. Quality is all over the place. And so with that, Let's do a comics review episode in which we talk about comics good and not so good. In my opinion, all of this stuff is wildly subjective, but I feel quite strongly about these books. Marvel, in my opinion, has been a floundering company creatively for several years. The reasons for this are many. Many of them, to me, are purely speculative. You can watch YouTube for hours on end and go down these really weird rabbit holes of Marvel being social justice warriors who care more about inclusion than they do about their content. I think that that's a canard, a red herring, and just, you know, hate speech. Good stories and diversity, there's no difference. It's a good story or it's not. Marvel has been floundering in the area of good stories. I don't know if it's because they're concerned about their movie franchises. You know, in the comics for decades now, they've been able to reboot Tony Stark, Iron Man, Captain America, The Avengers, basically reset the clock on these and start telling these stories anew with a new twist on them for new audiences and even old audiences who they don't want to lose. Now, when you've built the cinematic universe that has been wildly profitable beyond your craziest dreams, and you go ahead and you age people, you kill certain characters, You can't just keep rebooting them. So there is going to be an entire new phase of the Marvel Universe in which major figures, the most prominent characters of the last four phases of the MCU, simply won't exist. So the comics need to churn out IP. They also, I believe, under Disney, have a fairly limited budget as to what they're willing to pay these creators. So while floundering to create a next generation of movie characters... They're paying writers, artists, and editors fairly poorly as a sense of semi-stardom. Because saying you work at Marvel now is kind of a cool thing and makes up for a lot of that aforementioned poor salary. This leads to problems with quality control, which are rampant across Marvel's many titles. Another thing that Marvel does to dominate the market, to crush DC, and destroy independent publishers is put out Way too many books, books with no value, books that have no place on the shelf of any store, just so that they're dominating. You look at a bookshelf and it's Marvel, 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 Marvel. It's dizzying. It strikes me as a shady way to do business, but my point is that it results in a very watered down form of storytelling. This combined with another issue that's been rotting away at comics for years since any of the aforementioned problems became an issue. There had been a very real problem of event mania and event fatigue, wherein comics universes constantly have to be going through a form of Ragnarok, these destructive cycles of death and rebirth. Everything is always a crisis or a war. Superhero groups are forever fighting against each other, joining together to fight one common foe that's going to destroy the Earth. and. There was a time when these events could be legitimized a little bit. Right now, when everything is always an event, it's exhausting. It means that reading individual characters' titles often makes no sense if you're actually following said event. The ideas for things that are big, cool, exciting events are getting weaker and weaker. Events, in short, are replacing story. And that is where we come to Marvel's empire, spelled with a Y, as in funeral pyre. Why? I'm not sure. The story itself is ridiculous. In concept, in short, it's an attempt at exciting new readers while trying to retain the interest of readers from 40, 50 years ago by invoking the Kree-Scroll War, a very big Marvel event executed excellently 
over the course of like four issues of the Avengers. You did not need to have a million road to issues and tie in issues and cleanup issues and crossover of it. Like none of it was necessary to tell a very seminal story. So seminal that Empire couldn't exist without it. And yet Empire begins with two road to Empire books. One featuring the Avengers, written by a creator who I know to be very talented, Al Ewing. He is the writer of Immortal Hulk, a book that stuns me every time I read it, each new issue. That's a book I could review regularly. That's a book I read pretty much instantly every time it hits the stands. It is the best superhero book I've read in probably a couple of decades. It is inspiring. It takes the genre of superhero storytelling to brave, exciting, scary new heights. It's really changing the genre for the better. And yet Ewing can also take junk assignments and write them poorly, you know, clearly, because he's the guy who wrote Avengers Empire, or as it's actually titled, Avengers Empire Number Zero. It is a very long setup to try and clue readers in as to who these characters, these alien races around which Empire revolves, who they actually are and why you should care, and it fails miserably at that, while simultaneously writing the worst Avengers book I've read in quite a while. Some very hokey dialogue, just spoon-feeding the product to readers, and, I mean, I was shocked at how poor this was. I am not an event fan, but the way that this is being phoned in so far is, it's a new kind of mediocre. This event, by the way, is going to be all about, in addition to these alien races, the Avengers and the Fantastic Four. Fantastic Four are in terrible shape right now. They'd spent about 10 years being basically ostracized from Marvel. Books not being published, the characters not being included in big Marvel events and history celebrations and omnibuses because Fox had had the rights to the Fantastic Four. This was before Disney acquired Fox. And people way up top in charge of Marvel, like Carl Icahn, were so petty and mean and just nasty that they would rather sink their own properties than help a competitor with whom they're working on. So the X-Men and the Fantastic Four, but by far more the Fantastic Four, were ostracized, ignored, and essentially erased from history. Then after a disastrous 2015 movie, of which I don't have to tell you, I'm sure it was awful, Suddenly, very shortly after, Disney acquires Fox and everyone's interested in the Fantastic Four again. They're brought back under Dan Slott, a creator who is not firing on all cylinders right now. His titles are pretty bad. His characterizations of characters he's worked with for decades, he's just lost it. I don't know if it's that he's trying to be funny and he's not. That's certainly something that happens in one of these Empire issues. But the Fantastic Four look several decades older than they did before. Reed Richards looks like a very old man with a very young wife. The characterizations are all over the place. And probably half of Marvel's readers now have no idea who these people are because of the schemings of Carl Icahn and those like him who kept the FF out of the Marvel Universe. So now they're center stage because now they're Disney property again. And they get their own Empire number zero too. Fantastic Four Empire number zero. And it's... Long, plotting, stupid. Dan Slott takes great pride in inventing a new elder of the universe. If you watch Thor Ragnarok, the collector's one of those. They're all these, like, gods above gods, these great, massive cosmic forces. And this one is just a catty, campy fight club owner, the profiteer. It's really, really dopey. They're pitting a little Kree kid and a little Skrull kid against one another, reenacting the Kree-Skrull war. Again, something you really need to know a little bit about before diving into these issues. They try very hard to catch you up to speed on what it is they're referencing. That really, again, are just four Avengers titles. Just reprint them. Be infinitely better than these garbage titles. But after 40 pages of nonsense, the Fantastic Four rescue these kids, take them to Earth, and along the way make a discovery that paves the road to Empire. And now Empire number one is out, co-written by Al Ewing and Dan Slott. Illustrated by, <clears throat> it would be hilarious if I'm pronouncing this correctly, um, and I believe I actually am. Not a bad artist at all, but the hilariously named Valerio Shitty, <laughs> I, I, I do think that's the pronunciation. That's actually really a shame. The art is not the problem here. But it's two alien races against a third alien race. This third alien race being basically plant people. 
Plants are a big deal at Marvel right now. Plants are the main reason I'm not reading any X-Men books. The X-Men have become this weird terror state that is very interested in and involved in agriculture. I don't know what's going on at Marvel, to be honest with you. It's very strange. The X-Books had been, you know, before the Avengers movie, it was all about the X-Men for quite a long time, going back to the 1980s. Then again, in part because of people like Carl Icahn going, well, we don't have rights to X-Men, so let's not promote them. Let's make a big deal out of the Inhumans instead. That can't possibly backfire. Um, they are now making a big push for the X-Men under the helm of Jonathan Hickman, a writer who I've got mixed opinions of, but I don't think what he's doing with the X-Men and various mutant tie-in titles is very good. And maybe it's because I've got really bad allergies, which I really do, but I find all of this reference to horticulture flora to be deeply off-putting and just like the opposite of why someone would ever pick up a comic it is weird it makes me want to listen to some very fine quality art like stevie wonders the secret life of plants that album does illustrate that you can go into the realm of the green and create some cool stuff swamp thing illustrates the same thing but all of this stuff with trees and flowers it's not really flying for me I don't really think there's a Marvel book other than Immortal Hulk right now that's worth a dime. And these events, such as the rebirth of the X-Men as plant people and the Avengers and the Fantastic Four teaming up to deal with the massive threat caused by or opposed to a race of plant beings about whom not much is known and I don't think anyone cares. Yeah, I have an actual plant I can tend to. I'm growing catnip for my cat Bowie. It is infinitely more entertaining and worthwhile than reading any of these books. Sorry, I never like to take a book and just crap all over it, let alone a series of books or creators, but that's my opinion on the state of Marvel. Next week, I'll try and talk about some events and titles over at DC. I'm not loving their events either, but there are quite a few titles over there that I'm very fond of. In particular, Tom King is firing on all cylinders, doing the kind of story he does best right now in the excellent strange adventures. So I'd certainly like to talk about that. It's always nice when you've got something positive to say. Don't love to end the week on a negative note, but hey, it's going to be a good weekend and a chance for much better entertainment for us all. Thank you very much. Please consider subscribing. If you're on YouTube, you can also hit the bell for notifications. And if you're on a podcast app, you can leave me reviews. If you'd like to donate to this podcast, check out this episode's description for links. Also, there are links there for how you can follow me on social media, join my subreddit, things of that nature. Have a great weekend. Talk with you soon.